He just would walk by faith with an incredible vision that nothing was impossible with God. They had 500 teenagers in a Holiday Inn. I'm thinking how crazy that sounds now. All night prayer meetings don't seem like your typical youth attraction all event, but he discovered that kids at their core were really hungry for what was real, what was authentic. The frustration is that people were just satisfied to do status quo. Kids were staying all night, really crying out to God, and then he just started to imagine, like, if, if God is this intoxicating, what would an encounter with God be like for the whole church? The math just went in his head, like, if all these churches are experiencing this, we've got to do renewal to all these churches. How are we going to get to them? And it was like, well, we got to go to them. When I met Dell at college, he was very excited about the possibility of having a team that would minister and reach out to a lot of teenagers at one time. My dad was one of these guys who really was open to innovation. He thought that the best techniques of any era should be used for the best causes, and which to him was the gospel. Many thought, looking at him at 23, that he was dreaming too big. He was expecting too much too fast. There would not have been a Life Action Ministries if Dell had not been willing to buck those who said, this is a great idea, but it will never happen. But there was a core group of kids who would pray with us about the vision. It was, they'd brainstorm about what, how God would want to set it up, and the name Life Action was explored. Ministries and ministers often named their ministries after themselves. I think he had a sense that the work was so massive, the vision was so massive that it could never be accomplished by one person. So I think he took himself out of it at the beginning because he wanted to multiply. The name Life Action seemed to express what he was wanting for God to do, to bring life to the hearts of people and it would spur them into action and commitment and serving Christ. We had never been in the presence of God like that before. Wherever they were within a 50 mile radius, we were there. One more, just a little more taste of whatever it was. We got a call one day after they saw we were basically hanging around with them saying, how would you like to join Life Action? I just was so intrigued because I felt like there was something there that really resonated with the longings that God had been putting in my heart, which I didn't know anybody else who felt that way or had those longings. A lot of people come to Life Action for a lot of good reasons. I came because I had a friend who was on the team. He called me and said, why don't you come travel and see America? And that is all I knew of Life Action. Um, I always wanted to be in a Christian rock group, and I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Never heard a song, didn't know what I was getting into, and I got here, and it was choral music, and um, I got to see America. We were traveling and doing a production five nights a week. I'm not really proud of this, but I was involved in helping to pick out team outfits. Yes! No. So we were in New Orleans and we say, Pastor, what is it we can do? And he said, well, Mardi Gras is taking place. We end up in the Mardi Gras parade. Airstream trailers were the like Cadillac of trailers. Young drivers, big vehicles, crisscrossing the country. And we had numerous accidents with those Airstreams. They, they were a little fragile. Um, I met my wife in an accident. I, I'll just never forget, you can't do that much activity without some hiccups. I've had the privilege of being around a lot of good and godly men, but for the first 30 years of my life, I don't think that other than my own dad, any man had the kind of impact on my life 
that Dell Jr. did. Most days he would not arrive to the office until about 11 o'clock in the morning, sometimes noon, and he would come with a legal pad back then, and, and he would have all these notes from the time that he spent with God that morning. Dell was um, very intense and driven and visionary. We would go finish the meeting on Friday night, we would get in the, the truck and bus, drive all night, set up the next day and start the next day at the next church. And so um, we were either in a summit or driving. And when we were driving, um, we'd stop for lunch and Dell would run to the phone booth. And I remember years later, we're sitting in a staff meeting and, and he said, I would, I would sit there in the phone booth and I would think, boy, those team members, they probably think I am really you know, productive. And we're sitting there thinking, man, why didn't he have lunch? We had a meeting that was scheduled at a Southern Baptist church, and some of the other churches said, if you're going to go into that camp of churches, you can't, you can't be in our churches. So Dell had to make a decision, am I going to go where God wants me to go, or am I going to bow to the fear of man and do what, what this group wants me to do? I think one of the ironies uh, about my dad is that people constantly speak to how faith-filled he was, uh, but the reality is that the backstory of that faith was not without fear. Um, he was obviously concerned to do well and what people thought about him. Right before he died, he spoke so powerfully to how fear can limit our capacity, can distract us from our full potential, and how ultimately the greatest test for any person uh, in faith is actually dealing head on with fear. He just took a season of time and just dove into scripture and studied it. And it's almost like he came out of that season saying, we can no longer bow to a whole segment of evangelicalism, fundamentalism, uh, that would say, um, man, you can't do this and you can't do that. He says, look, I'll go to a Catholic church if there's no strings attached. He wrote this book on separation, biblically defined, and just said, I, I can't see where the Bible says I can't minister in these churches if my ministry or my message is not restricted. He didn't race into danger. He wasn't looking for controversy, but he was willing to walk into controversy and to be true to the scripture, to have his conscience bound by the word and the spirit of God. Even if people he knew and loved and valued their opinion, said that's the wrong thing to do. Boy, the response, it was, uh, it was not good. We lost every single church invitation out of an annual schedule of at least 60 protracted meetings every year. We had nowhere to go with any of our teams that Sunday morning. Dell calls an all-night prayer meeting, <laughs> and we get on our knees, and he says, God, we don't, we don't know what you have. We don't know where to go. We're going to have to send everybody home. And that next day, a church called and said, is there any way that you can come this Sunday morning? I mean, like tomorrow morning. So we pack up our trucks, all of our, we go to that church. And God so moved in that one single church that we ended up staying in that very vicinity of central Pennsylvania for probably three full months, brought the other teams in to get around to all the churches that were now hungry for what they saw God do. Now, it was also in that context that um, a major uh, production, stage production called America, You Too Young to Die was birthed. did bring back the glory stage production. It had radio broadcasts, did television spots. It's like there was no end to what God could raise up and use in and through this ministry. Byron called and said, um, we're gonna have a conference call tomorrow morning on Saturday morning because Dell has been diagnosed with cancer.
Then he went and had uh, surgery. As they wheeled him to the operating room, um, there was an emergency. And so they had to set him in the hallway. He was prepped for surgery. They set him in the hallway, put partitions around him. So he sat in the, in the hall for hours waiting to get into surgery. And while he was there, he said, God just, God just spoke to me and said, um, you're going to be healed. I was with um, Dell's wife and his oldest son, and we sat there with the uh, surgeon and got the outcome and saying it's terminal. Uh, they did all they could do, but no surgery was going to resolve it. And you got to decide what your next steps were. Well, I'm not going to lie about this part. Like uh, his illness, getting the brain tumor, was a shock. Uh, it was a very dark period uh, in my life for sure, but I think in a lot of a lot of our lives in the ministry at that time. I mean, he's only 41 at that point. And could this really be happened to a 41-year-old leader of a major ministry that was growing and I felt being used of God so powerfully? It was like, in many ways, getting ejected from a speeding train. We were literally, we were literally going 100 miles an hour and came to a complete screeching halt. That was a huge, hard, tearful time for everybody involved. A couple of weeks before he died, he said, "What's gonna if, if I don't make it? What's gonna um, you know keep this ministry going?" And we kind of identified those twelve cutting edge commitments. And so Byron um, said, "Okay, Dell, we talked about this and this and this and this and this." And then we all looked down at Dell, and I remember him saying, "You guys have to you have to stop looking at the end of the table. You're gonna have to start looking to to the Lord." There was prayer. There was the longing that the Lord would spare his life. We know God can heal. Is he going to choose to? I'm telling you, we were so swept in to the fact that, that he was a godly man, and his heart was always seemingly in the right place. It was like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then Dell. He was like the fourth, fourth person of the Trinity. you know. And so when he said something, it was like, well, of course. I mean, he, he knows God, walks with God. If God says he's going to heal, heal Dell, then that's going to happen. Those were very special, challenging days. He would probably not be having any more meetings for a while and, until God healed him. Uh, and so we, they carried him up the stairs in that house to his bedroom, and he never left until he was um, carried out by an ambulance. You know, when, when he uh, um, finally stopped breathing, and um, I remember we started, we just circled around the room and we started singing um, um, some choruses. And uh, one, one of the songs, you know, My Jesus, I Love Thee, I Know Thou Art Mine. And there's one verse that later one of the guys said to me, you know, a verse we didn't sing, I'll love thee in life, I'll love thee in death. I'll love thee as long as thou lendest me breath. And um, I think that was true of Dell. I think he um, um, loved God to um, uh, the maximum and to the very end. And I, I, I think for, um, um, for years and still, I'll occasionally have, um, I don't know if it's a dream or thoughts or whatever, and, and um, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> have uh, like conversations and, not, not, and it's like oh man he's not here to have that conversation and um, there's, no, there's nobody else I've had that experience with too um, um, because basically he was, he was my Paul in the faith and what I know about um, most things in life I learned from him the reason that his death was so painful was that the, that the ministry team was so close. The pain of all that uh, was not only, not only corporate, like, wow, we lost a ministry leader, but it was also personal, you know, because we lost, a, I, I lost a father, you know, people lost a friend. I won't lie, there were a lot of tears. I can remember sitting with Byron and Sue Paulus in their vehicle as we left the hospital that morning. We loved this man, we loved and love his family, and we loved the years of serving together. And at that moment, it was really hard to think, what would life and ministry be like without Dell?
They invited me as a 17-year-old to the post-mortem like, meeting, literally the meeting after his death, when the leaders were together just trying to figure out, what do we do now? Uh, we called a, a, a confidant, we called who was then vice president of the largest Christian organization in the world, Steve Douglas. We told him um, what had happened. And then he asked this question, who gave birth to Life Action Ministries? I went through the whole birthing story right there in front of our key leaders and Steve Douglas of how in St. Petersburg, Florida, our founder was a youth pastor, called a prayer meeting, and uh, he listens. And <laughs> I'll never forget, he says, now, who gave birth to the ministry? And I'm thinking to myself, aren't you listening? So I give him an abbreviated version of that story. I finish the second time, and he says, now, who gave birth to the ministry? And I remember saying, oh. You mean God did, not Dal Faisenfeld Jr. <laughs> I, I just remember watching this dynamic with the leaders because they were thinking, wow, you know, we've lost the, the life force of the ministry. Like, how do we strategically and practically even survive this? And this guy just reminded them that the heartbeat and the mission of this ministry of life action itself was not actually owned by Dal Faisenfeld. It was, it was from God. He said, well then, if God gave birth to this ministry, which one of you are willing to stand before him someday and tell him that he was finished with what he gave birth to? And I remember thinking that would really be stupid. <laughs> but that was the impetus. From the moment that that group of leaders got a hold of this idea that the calling of God was still on their lives for this mission, was the moment that this ministry really began to multiply. For years I had been involved in women's ministry, writing, speaking to women, and then God opened a door for us to begin a daily radio program of teaching the Word to women. Providentially, at that time, Elizabeth Elliott, who had been such an influence to women across the nation, was slowing down and preparing to retire from her longtime radio ministry called Gateway to Joy. And long story short, but had been Gateway to Joy, became Revive Our Hearts. So here was this really talented, called by God person who was ministering most of her life action you know, career right alongside of my dad. And so because she was always right alongside my dad, the scope of what she was able to do was only as wide as what my dad was doing. But after, after he, his death, Nancy then began to think and pray in directions that, that went everywhere. And what you see today in Revive Our Hearts is actually the full, you know, is the fruition and the flowering of her being released. In reality, as tragic as Dell's death was, God used that to multiply our ministry in incredible ways. I am really excited about being in ministry in Life Action right now. It's not about any voice, it's God's ministry. It's about His voice. It's God who started this ministry, and it's God who keeps it going. And that's going to be true after those of us who are on scene today are gone as well. The doors have never been opened any wider for a ministry like ours, and the need has never been any greater. It probably won't look the same. It won't look the same as it did in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. But what we hope will remain unaltered is that fixed, that true north of the Lordship of Christ, the authority of Scripture, and the mission that He has entrusted to us.